Today is a very special BizHack Live, uh, and not only because I'm coming to you from the mountains of Blue Ridge, Georgia, and Lily is in Puebla, Mexico, uh, but because I'm overjoyed to introduce BizHack's uh, fourth ever lead instructor, Alex Oliveira. So in the seven years that we've been teaching digital marketing for small businesses, we've had an extraordinary run of amazing lead instructors. And um, Alex Oliveira is joining that um, kind of prestigious group. And uh, I'm really overjoyed to welcome you, Alex, to the BizHack family. Um, on Monday, we are kicking off our 18th cohort. Um, a number of you uh, who are on today's live webinar are going to be joining us for that. Uh, Amy Williams is going to be back. Um, I saw Ross Can is in the group. Um, uh, Michelle Rupp. Um, I also want to welcome our new intern, McKenna Kaufman, um, Omar Sanchez. Um, so welcome, guys, to the BizHack family. Uh, Ian Taput, uh, David Lepak, uh, Carol Heller. And thanks also to some of our amazing alumni, uh, also Amy Williams, uh, Armando Anderson, uh, Adriana, you've been here with us every step of the way, we love it. Um, welcome Allison McLaney, uh, who's gonna be part of our upcoming cohort, which starts on Monday. Uh, and my apologies if I missed anybody, Maria, Maria Luisa uh, Castellanos, um, but, Today is really a special day. It's a chance for Alex to show off, frankly, why we hired him, what he has learned over the last 10 years, generating 22 million leads for 3,000 small businesses. Alex specializes in small business lead generation for businesses that have a salesperson or a sales team. So it's not e-commerce. It's really about leads, which is getting people's contact info, um, their email and their phone number, not e-commerce or online sales. And Alex runs an agency called Predict Media, and he has given more than 300 workshops about this topic to top industry groups, universities, uh, you name it, he's been there. Um, Alex, in, in honesty, I've been trying to get um, the folks at the Jim Moran Institute to let me be their instructor for two years. And they just keep telling me, look, we're all set. We have a great guy teaching, uh, no need for you. And it's frustrated me until I learned it was you. And now I'm thrilled because you're part of the BizHack family now. So uh, if you can't beat them, you hire them. Um, without further ado, my new best friend, Alex Oliveira, Welcome to the BizHack family, and we're excited to learn from you now and in the course that starts on Monday. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. That's a very nice, warm introduction. I'm going to share the slides here. Give me one second, and then uh, we will get started. Okay, great, great. So again, we are here to um, talk lead gen, right? And hopefully, you guys can get a lot out of today's presentation. That is my goal. I'll start with the, this first picture of my little family here, my, my kids and my wife. Uh, we are in sort of central Florida and we homeschool the four kids. So if you, if you hear any noise, they're about to wrap it up in a little bit. I finished my part and then I jumped on here. So if you hear anything, we're gonna blame my wife um, and she'll be okay with that. No, but we do it together and we run the business together, by the way. So. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I come from a family in Brazil that was constantly searching for a bigger, better life. And when we moved from Sao Paulo to the South Florida market here in 1988, you know, the family really came for a better life. And in my family, in the whole history of the family, they've always believed that owning their own business was the best path to success. But what I saw growing up was lots of successes, lots of failures, and it seemed like no one could hold on to that success. Um, so for me, I was trying to figure out, well, how can they, you know, grow a business that is sustainable? 
So for me as a child, I, I was lucky. I, I watched and helped my mom and dad build a business that started in the living room that eventually became a multi-million dollar business where we had 50 plus employees. So it was great. I sort of had the school of the hard knocks right from a, from a young age. So at this point, I've dedicated my career to build a resilient business and to help other entrepreneurs do the same. So our company predict we are dedicated to using lead generation to build sustainable businesses. Like Dan mentioned, we've, we've worked with over 3000 small businesses and with many fortune 500 brands in the, in the last 10 years. So my goal here today is to share proven strategies and, you know, likely you're using some of these and if they're working for you, great. But um, at the end, I'm going to share a guide. I put together the top 10 resources that are free for you to take advantage of. And my hope is that you can at least use one tactic you learn today. And at any point, uh, the, Dan or Lilia, if they have to interrupt me, it's no problem. I want this to be conversational um, and not just me talking at you guys. All right. So let's get into it. How did we generate the 22 million leads that, that, that we did over the last 10 years? Well, it was a lot through affiliate marketing. For those of you who are not familiar with affiliate marketing, this is how it basically works. Uh, an advertiser works with a website owner that can drive traffic, their offer. And what you see here on the right side, the, the biggest company is Rakuten. They are what's called an affiliate network. So they are sort of the in-between that says, okay, advertisers, companies, brands, you need traffic and website owners, you can send traffic to the right audiences. So that's basically how affiliate marketing works um, from a 30,000 foot view. And over the years, what we did as Predict, uh, this year we're turning 10, we launched different marketplaces, different brands in the insurance industry, in the home improvement, legal, and any others. And we would have these platforms that we would drive traffic to. And then that traffic would then either capture a lead or, or the click would end up in the advertiser's website. And here are some of the advertisers that we've worked with over the last 10 years. Okay. So for, for you and for most businesses, it's you're looking at, you've got the buyers searching online right here on the left. And then you've got marketing channels that you have to decide where you're going to present your offer, email, SEO, PPC, and so on. In the middle is where we as a company would have a marketplace or in other examples, you might have an Amazon. And then the user that started their journey all the way here through one of these channels will end up on the advertiser's brand uh, website to buy the product or service. So this is basically the workflow of how it works. Now, of course, there's lots of different touch points through that um, funnel. And like the little ShamWow guy here, you gotta have an offer. I know Dan and the team at BizHack do a great job. I've looked at the curriculum. They do a fantastic job talking about the offer. The offer is important, right? That's what's gonna drive the clicks. All right. So our agenda for today, we're going to go through a couple marketing discovery questions, which should prompt you to think about what you're doing and how you can make your lead gen strategy better. Then we're going to just touch on a couple of uh, uh, things about lead gen, just to give you some knowledge. I'll go through the five different strategies that I laid out when you guys signed up for the uh, webinar or master class. You know, I was talking to a guy yesterday and he said, hey, you don't call it webinar anymore. You got to call it a master class. So I'm going to talk to Dan about that because apparently master class is much sexier than, than a webinar. And then we're going to finish it off with the conversion rate, which is your analytics. And for the financial people, it's the ROI, right? They want to know what the return on investment is. Okay, so let's get into the question part. How are how are people searching for your product or service online? Do you know, are they coming through your website? Are they engaging with your content? Are they on social media? Where are they? How do you measure? I want you to think about that. And at the end, if, if you're struggling to come up with questions, let's talk about that. But it's very important to know how people are searching and if you are serving them in those channels, right? How does your strategy stack up against the competitors? This is also very important. You know, online, you can very easily do your due diligence and secret shop and find out 
how many clicks your, your competitors are driving to their website, what channels they're in. There's tons of tools that will do that for you, like SEMrush, Moz, SpyFu, and, and many others, which I'll share in the document as well. But here's a stat that is very important both to marketing sales as well as business owners. Uh, and there's tons of studies from MIT to Harvard that have studied sales cycles. And it'll say that you are 21 times more likely to talk to the lead, to the prospect, if you contact them in less than five minutes versus 30 minutes. So consider that, that if you're getting a lead online and you're taking more than 30 minutes, your chances just went down by 21 times. So follow up quickly. We are all in that Google micro moment where everyone is on their smartphones and they want you to you know, call them up right away. So it's super important. Uh, and, and here's a little meme. You know, I can't go without the memes, but I put that one because of LinkedIn. You know, I feel like LinkedIn these days just has changed so much. Uh, I get so many uh, emails or solicitations and it's not as valuable anymore unless you run ads. So for leads, if you wanna generate leads on LinkedIn, you gotta run some ads. All right, what's your click, lead and call conversion rate? And we're gonna talk about that at the end, but I want you to think about the funnel. I know BizHack has covered the funnel in a lot of different ways. I've seen all the graphics, they're amazing. Sideways, upside down, vertical, horizontal. The funnel is just, look, your customer starts here and they go through that journey. And at the end, they become your customer. And beyond that is the advocacy. Are they going to become a raving fan? But you really got to figure out your funnel. That's super important. And your conversion rate. And I'm going to share a little clip here from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. If uh, some of you haven't seen the movie, uh, hopefully the sound is playing. If not, let me know, Lilia. It's a 30 second clip. You get the picture? Are you laughing now? You've got leads. Mitch and Murray paid good money. Get their names to sell them. You can't close the leads you're given. You can't close shit. You are shit. Hit the bricks, pal, and beat it, because you are going out. The leads are weak. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide here. So the leads are weak. So are the leads really the problem in your organization? Only you can answer that, right? Here's another meme. You know, this meme is, is sort of interesting because it, it's so many of us would like to, to believe that when we hire salespeople and they, they come and we train them and they start and at the, some point the honeymoon phase is over, we tend to blame the salespeople, right? But I guess what I want to say to you, whether it's your marketing people, salespeople, anyone in your organization, how are you nurturing your own team? How are you giving them love? Because if they're not reciprocating, it's one thing, but if you're not giving them the same love that they deserve, you can't expect them to go out there and be a super, in this case, salesperson every day, because it's not gonna happen, right? And I hope most of you uh, businesses, small or medium, are using behavioral assessments when you're hiring people, super important, like DISC and emotional intelligence, and those things all play into marketing as well. All right, so let's talk about the uh, traffic sources. You see the little book up here on the left-hand side. I've put these just so you know we're still in the knowledge part of our presentation. Traffic sources, you've got own media, earned media, paid and shared. I leaned heavily on own media for long-term strategy, right? For SEO, for uh, what I put on my website, the content, my email marketing campaigns. I I don't depend on an algorithm for that. I, sh I do for SEO, but not for my website itself. If I can drive traffic to my website, I control that media. Whereas I can't really always control the narrative or the comments or the feedback on social media, like shared. Uh, and paid ads, it's, it's obvious. You wanna grow, you gotta run ads. You just have to. Every company that succeeds online today has a paid ad strategy. Does it have to be thousands of dollars a month? No but you have to run some ads. So what platforms, social platforms should you be on? I mean, here's the top list. I've tested with TikTok, haven't figured out how to generate leads on TikTok yet, but many of the other platforms I have. And I would never recommend that anyone to any business that you have to be on every platform because you don't. 
you have to figure out where your audience is at and if you're able to engage with them there. And then, of course, there's the big, big bad wolves. And we'll talk about Facebook a lot because they do provide lots of tools, just like Google and Amazon, for small businesses. But let's face it, they're in it to make money, grow, make their shareholders money. So they're, they're always going to sort of sit in the middle between the consumer, the buyer, and us businesses, the seller, right? So for search, when you're running search, pay, search paid ads, it's going to be Google and Facebook. If you're running shopping ads, if you're an e-commerce company, it's kind of hard to do with not going to uh, Amazon, right? And so here, here's a, an ad for lead generation um, on Google, Google local services. And, and Google has done this many times where I type in, let's say right now, dentist, or in this case, it was actually a lawyer, business lawyer near me. And it says Google screen. You will see this for the home services industry and for the legal industry. Google's actually competing with their own advertisers. They have a lead program that they built that you can buy leads directly from Google. So not only do they sell the ads, they also want to be in the lead generation business. And by the way, they've tested with many, many different verticals. If they haven't tested with yours yet, they probably will at some point. So some campaign must before you do your campaign. And I know that the program, the digital marketing course talks a lot about these touch points here, like your target audience, your product offer, the analytics and customer journey. But I want to make sure that you guys, before you run a lead gen campaign of any kind, especially the ones we're going to discuss here in a minute, you run a website audit and figure out if your website is functioning properly. Super, super important. So here's one thing. I run an ad, let's say, uh, and this one is a roofer, roofer West Palm Beach. And the roofing ad comes up here. Here's what I was talking about with the Google local services ad. They're actually, you know, placing it above the actual companies who are running real search and display ads, which is really not good, but neither here nor there. But if, if I click on this ad for all tech uh, roofing, I go to the landing page. What's the problem with this landing page, guys? Like I said, pay attention to your website. The problem with this landing page, first and foremost, is you have social media links right on the header. If you're running ads, you're paying for those clicks, you don't want to send them to your website and then give them links to other websites. So the first thing that I would do to your landing page if I were running ads is I get rid of every link on that page where they land from the ad. Get rid of every, not only the menu buttons, but links to social media. And even if I'm not running ads, just place the social media icons in the footer of your website. Second problem with this form, it's good. It's a short form. It's got a good call to action, free estimate, but the submit button, no one wants submit, right? They, they would want to add something like get quote, talk to us or something that is a little bit more warm. But there's lots of things that you can do to your website by running a website audit. A-B testing, subject lines, call to action button colors. These colors do phenomenal. Now, if you want to go and use a color outside of here, go right ahead. But every UX um, uh, stat out there shows that these are the best colors, right? And you want to test the image, the, the copy, the bullets, like everything on that landing page for that lead ad. And then the lead funnel. I know Dan talks a lot in the uh, course about the customer journey. Customer journey comes here. You're using yes, no logic, right? Conditional formatting within the forms. What happens in that journey? If they click yes, do they go here? If they download the ebook, do they go there? Where does the drip campaign take them? So this is just an example of a uh, software called Active Demand. And it's really easy to create workflows. And there's many others out there as well. So lead gen must qualify your leads, nurture your leads, compliance, basics and measure and optimize, super important. I wanna focus for a second on nurture your leads. Uh, last year, we brought on a client, a law firm, who on average would contact new leads that came in for 10 days. That's 10 days, that's it. Their team would contact the lead for 10 days. And I said, you can't do that. You have to nurture those leads because you know, probably half those people in most industries, it's half, probably half or more are not going to be ready to purchase or even talk to you until a month or two or three or four. It depends. It's different for every industry. Like in the auto industry, we've worked with many dealerships and companies like AutoNation. Uh, 
new car buyers, not used, new car buyers, more than half the leads that come in are not ready to purchase a vehicle until after 30 days. So you see, you've got to nurture that lead. Keep following up, not for 10 days, but sometimes for six months. So if you guys are doing, you know, if you're nurturing your leads, great. If you're not, start. And I know creativity is hard for all of us, right? I'm not a graphic designer and, you know, I'm not a brand strategist, but I get the need for creativity. So I use this concept here um, called design thinking. It's just a framework for innovation and it focuses a lot on empathy. You see step one is to empathize. So if I'm creating a lead generation campaign with a client, I'm looking at different channels. We start with the question, how, like, why are we running this? How does this, how does the call to action, the links, the images, how does that benefit the end user first? And then how can we be innovative? Because as you know, online, the name of the game is how can you uh, uh, set yourself apart from the competition? So that sometimes means doing creatives that are completely what the user is not expecting, right? And I'm sure you guys have seen that. And I also know that at BizHack, they use smart goals very often. So super important. You're building a lead gen campaign. You want to use a process, a system. And using smart goals to build your lead gen campaigns are super, super important. For me, lead gen campaigns come down to the team, the budget, and the time. Those three things. So whatever you do with the, the next few slides that we're, we're going to discuss, just think about that. What kind of budget do you want to put in? Start small. A hundred dollars. Take a, a, a time, make a time bound. Say, I'm going to do it over the next 30 days and then figure out who's going to do it with you. Who's going to measure, who's going to launch it and, and execute rather than just talking. All right. So let's get to it now. The first strategy is an ebook. As you can see here on the left, this is an ebook I wrote last year. I probably have written uh, an ebook every year for the past five years. And they typically generate, uh, they, they're made up of between 50 to 100 pages. A little bit heavy, but I like to write that much content, about 20,000 words, because it gives me a lot of SEO juice when I break it up into dozens and dozens of blogs and repurpose it in social media and whatnot. So you're an expert in your industry. What can you talk about? Do you have an ebook? If so, let's talk about it at the end and, and you tell me how it's working for you. But you, what you want to do is look for who's going to be downloading it and, and then nurture those leads. That's the good old inbound marketing, um, you know, content block that has worked very well for the last really 15 or so years um, ever since uh, HubSpot really kind of came out with that concept of inbound marketing. Yeah. So really quickly, could you define what an ebook is? Cause I know that not everybody really fully understands that an ebook is not quite as scary or intimidating as they might think. Yeah, and, that's a great question, Dan. Yeah, and just a quick word, you know, HubSpot is one of the great software companies, but they're also one of the great thought leaders in digital marketing. And their inbound marketing system, along with like Russell Brunson's marketing funnels, I think are one of the most important innovations in digital marketing training and education. And I definitely subscribe to the inbound methodology and encourage you guys to learn more about it. Um, you know, BizHack is aiming to make itself, you know, another creator of a system. We call it the lead building system. So I, I look at these guys uh, for um, examples and best practices. And, you know, maybe one day we'll be as big as, as HubSpot is. Uh, but going back to the, the idea with the inbound is that you want people to come to you because you've established yourself as a thought leader and a trusted source of high quality information. And the ebook is like your best calling card. Can you just talk really quickly about what you mean by an ebook? Sure, Dan. Uh, you know, ebook is simply a guide or a manual or a mini book. And it doesn't have to be 20,000 words. It could actually be 10 pages and a thousand words. It could be visual, but it, it's basically a type of content to educate your target audience. So again, what's your expertise and passion? Uh, what topics do you want to cover? It's very important. So look within your industry, look at the competitors and get examples of what they're doing. Download their eBooks or guides, right? Some people call it a guide and, and take a look at it. 
you know, but you want to get a design right and you want to get it written right. And so for those of us who are not writers, that's okay. I'm giving you a couple of different resources here, like Fiverr, Text Broker, Upwork, and Book Baby, that can help you write the ebook. And then you can be the person who edits and make sure makes sure that the information there is right. But again, you you want to educate your audience. That is the purpose. That's number one. Number two, you want to get it out there and distribute it so that you can generate inbound traffic and leads. And last but not least, the, the SEO piece of it. If you are the expert in your industry and you optimize that content properly on your website, you're gonna drive traffic, okay? And so what you wanna find out is how you're gonna promote it. Don't just write the ebook and say, huh, what do I do now? Do I just email it to hundred people, throw it on sh social media and hope for the best? No, you gotta figure out how you're gonna promote it and, and what your lead gen goal is gonna be. And, and by the way, there are e-commerce companies that sell products that do ebooks, right? You don't have to just be a service provider um, type business. So here is a case study for an ebook uh, that we did. Uh, let me move this over here. Okay. We wrote the ebook for the client and then we distributed, as you can see here, PPC, email, and Facebook ads three different channels. You could see what was spent about $2,100 uh, for the pay-per-click ads. And you can see the Facebook ads, they spent about $1,600, generated 265 leads. And the only part that was a little bit uh, not so good was the email. They had 57, actually almost 60,000 email subscribers, but they weren't doing email marketing properly. So they only got, I don't know, about eight, 9% uh, open rate but they did get 542 clicks to the website. And in the end, that ebook, that cost them about $2,000 to, to build, to create, to write, cost them about $2,000. They were able to reach 50,000 people, um, drive 2,700 clicks to the website and generate 421 leads. And I can go further into what the sales were, but obviously it's, it's you know, further down the line and in attribution, but I know that they did get clients from the ebook. And by the way, for this client, getting one new customer was worth the cost of the campaign and the ebook many times over. So, so Tino had a question. What time frame were the were you talking about here in these stats? Uh, okay, so this was January right here of this year. Oh that wow, this is one month. Oh yeah, yeah. This is for, well for Facebook, right? So what we did, we started with the email campaign in December, and then we did pay-per-click ads in January and February. And then we just did a one month campaign on Facebook to drive calls. The purpose was to get leads, but also drive calls. You know, this might sound kind of, well, anyway, 2000 bucks to write an ebook, that's it? Uh, on uh, text broker, yes, on text broker. You, wow. Now you could pick different levels of writers. You could pick a level five writer who's going to cost you $10,000. But what I would say is you as the expert need to put together your topic and write out the shell, right? Write out the, the bullet points. What am I going to cover? And give them the resources as well. And then they're just going to write it. You're going to get it. You're going to read it. And you're going to edit. Ah, you know, we're lucky because my wife is an editor. I mean, she is a writer by trade. So all the clients that work with us get her and she is... Amazing. If I had to do it on my own, I wouldn't. I'd probably pay, you know, 100, 200 bucks an hour for a good editor. That might break the bank. But I, I, I can definitely say this, Dan, just getting the, the uh, average level writer on text broker or book baby is not enough. You still need an editor there. So there's, there's definitely a little bit more cost. You know, <laughs> there's so many ways in which my background inhibit me as a marketer. Uh, and one of them is I'm a professional level writer and journalist uh, who went and got an MFA in creative nonfiction. The idea of hiring someone on text broker to write a book for me with my name on it for 2000 bucks, like literally gives me physical shutters because I know how crappy it would be. Yeah. Um, but I also teach in my class that delayed perfection versus timely implementation 
and that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Mm. And so I recognize that I personally have a limiting belief and also some, some things I need to work through to help get my ebook out. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is Ian Taput asked, would this work for like corporate buyers or B2B? Not only would it work for them, but it's ideal for them. Yes. Most B2B sellers lead generate through knowledge sharing. And an ebook is a great form of knowledge sharing. And you it shouldn't is. charge for it. You should just put it behind a paywall, not a paywall, behind a lead form where they have to give you their email, their phone number, and maybe tell you a little bit about who they are. The, the topic of the book should specifically be something that only your ideal customer would want to download. Um, I don't want to delay, the, there are five tools and we're only in number two, but I do just want you to understand that the purpose of an ebook is a behavioral targeting technique that through the act of downloading it, they're basically indicating they're your ideal client. So the topic of the book has to be aligned with you, who your ideal client is and the kind of thing that only they would download. Makes sense. So the reason I like um, the idea of an ebook as building a content marketing strategy is that you're starting with a big block of content. And from there, I'm just gonna give you an example here. Last year when COVID hit, I said, hey, you know, we're not going to be going to trade shows, which for us as an organization over the last 10 years, the number one way that we generated leads, B2B, was going to trade shows around the world. We were in Vegas four times a year, New York, Chicago. Now we couldn't do that anymore. So we had to figure out, okay, are we going to do webinars? Are we going to do videos, podcasts? Like, what are we going to do? And I figured, you know what? Let's take the ebook first, because we had been writing ebooks in the past, but not really distributing it beyond our audience, our customers. So I said, look, if we start with the ebook and then build the webinar series, and then from there repurpose that content in blocks, I think that this content can last us a year, right? And that's what we did. So for us, and I'm giving you an example here, we created a series of 12 webinars last year. We worked on it from March uh, through May, and then we launched it from June to December. We did 12 webinars. The cost was you know, listen, 150 staff hours. On average, we had 25 attendees. Many of these were people that had not engaged with us yet. We weren't really inviting our current clients. For that, we had other types of webinars. But we added about 500 emails to our list. We used, of course, Facebook and all the other methods. Uh, we drove more than 2,000 clicks to the website, generated more than 25 leads. The total cost out the door was $10,000. And there was about four of us in my organization involved. We generated five new clients that netted for us over or grossed us over $100,000 in sales. So again, that all started with the ebook. From the ebook, I broke up the lead gen ebook into all these different uh, buckets of content. And it worked really well for us. So, and we're here doing a webinar today with BizHack and you guys are here. So you're proof that a masterclass, a, a, a expert session, uh, a webinar, it works. People come, but it takes time. You might start and five people will show up. After you're doing it for six months, more people show up. And I know it's not useful for every type of business, but you should try it. YouTube ads, elevating the brand and awareness and increasing your SEO is really important. Uh, you could see here, actually, the... Uh, a display ad that uh, we are running for a client on YouTube. So this is an actual YouTube video that is then brought into the Google ads platform and then ran as an ad. But what's important about that ad for lead gen is that at the end of this video, there is a, a, a uh, site link with a form. So it's in a, a link extension is what they call it. So when the user, the viewer watches the whole video, which is only about 46 seconds, when they get to the end, they're presented with an embedded form. First name, last name, email, phone number. They click call and they get the guide and then they begins that sort of you know, uh, automation. They get a call, they get an email and that's sort of like the, uh, the workflow for this client. And you can see here on Google ads, when you come in here and you create a lead ad, 
just like Facebook. You create the form, you choose the fields, you can pull content from YouTube or from Gmail, but it's really, really easy and it works. So I'll give you the uh, case study for this one. Uh, let me move this here. It generated, I don't care about the impressions so much, but I do care about the views. It generated, the video generated 28,000 views. The cost per view, as you can see here, was six cents. Six cents. So pretty good. I can tell you that that video probably wouldn't have gotten more than 10 views had we not promoted the video in the way that we did. The campaign cost was $1,600. Um, it generated more than 1,300 clicks and what they call the cost per thousand or CPM was $8.15. Most of them were mobile users, but it did the job, right? It did the job and it generated leads for the client. It generated the clicks. All right, Facebook ads. You, I, I know that uh, BizHack does a great job with this in their class. So this shouldn't be anything new for you guys, but it's just hammering on the opportunity of not always selling on Facebook, like with this particular client, as you can see, last year, they're a law firm. So last year, instead of doing a lead ad campaign to generate social security disability leads for the, the law firm, well, we decided to create some stories and, and the firm and the attorneys decided, hey, we're, we're passionate about politics and we're in the legal sort of field here. So why not promote voting. And it was a little bit edgy, right? Some people said, no, don't do it. That's not good. And yes, by the way, those lead ads that ran with videos and static images did get some hate mail and, you know, nasty messages in the comments. Well, you just hide them, right? Because you're always going to have trolls. But nevertheless, it was a go vote campaign all around the firm just saying, hey, we, we're going to do, you know, help you understand why it's important to vote. And we created a bunch of different graphics. Um, and you can see here that one lead gen campaign over the course of, they started early all from August and it went all the way through about November. It generated 202 leads. Now for legal, as you saw in the other Facebook lead ad, it was like $7 cost per click or, or cost per lead. Whereas in the legal industry, $35 cost per lead is still pretty good, right? But it reached over 70,000 people. But here's what's important about the content that was created around that story and that social cause for the organization. It was that we created over 30 posts, really well thought out posts about the election and voting. There were over a hundred custom images made. And, and of course we wrote blogs as well. So over 4,000 words. That campaign that generated 202 leads reached 6.8 million people. On, on Facebook and Instagram. So, you know, it's a, it's a big reach. And you could see the organic for the same post, guys, a quarter million. So not even close. What, what's the point I'm making here? Is that if you want to win on Facebook, on Google, and these platforms, you have to be willing to invest some money because otherwise your audience is not going to see your content magically. It's not going to happen. All right, the last one here, guys. Chat, super important, right? Ask yourself, how's your communication? What's your conversion rate? People come to your website, they're trying to log in, maybe there's speed issues, there's no chat, they leave the bounce rate. Are you aware of your bounce rate? So it's really important. And what I like about chat for the clients that we've implemented is that it's, it's real time and you're solving problems in real time, whether it be sales, customer service, product questions, all real time. And I, and you know, this uh, organization called Apex, which I'm going to give you the link to, they do lead gen a little bit different. You can get their technology implemented in your website, like a little chat uh, icon anywhere on the website. If, if they do not generate a lead, and I'm talking a real human, not AI here, not AI. AI, you can do a bot with Facebook and all of that, but that's still not going to generate leads for you at the level that I'm talking about here. With a human there answering real questions that they understand your product or service, this company, Apex, will charge you not on the conversations or a monthly fee. They charge based on the number of leads they generate for you. So they try to engage 
and then bring that user to either a phone call or a booking button so that they can book a button, a call with the sales team. So again, the point of chat here isn't to just be there to, to answer the frequently asked questions, which you can do with a bot. The point here is having a real live chat, a real human behind there. So here's the Apex um, uh, uh, case study here. This one builder put it on their website. Uh, I believe it was called Southern Builders. And uh, they increased their leads by 2000. So what they found was in this case study, and I, I, I dug deep into it to see even like uh, heat maps to understand what was happening with the users in real time on the website, that they were just clicking around, clicking around, didn't understand how to use the calculator and they would leave. As soon as they put the chat button there and the agent popped up and started to have a real human conversation with them, the leads went through the roof. Now, again, this sort of technology only makes sense if you get enough um, uh, clicks to your website. So, you know, if you've got maybe a thousand clicks a month, it might not make sense for you. But if you've got more than a thousand clicks a month on your website, chances are you can increase conversion big time and generate a lot more leads. And the cost is, is really great here. So, again, another little, uh, um, a meme here to share with you guys about your product. Always be there. And that's the point of the chat, right? You hear somebody talking about your product, you jump in and see how you can be helpful. Okay. All right. So now we, now that we have the five strategies, I'm going to touch on for just a minute, the conversion rate. You have to understand on both sides, on the marketing side and the sales side, both, right? What is happening? The acquisition, the behavior, the conversion. Sure, you could do that on Google Analytics or your web analytics software, figure out how many people are coming to the website, what pages are converting, how long are they staying, right? What was the conversion rate? That's easy to do with marketing. What you really want to do, though, is align these right here with your sales team and figure out, I, I generated X number of leads from my marketing campaign. How many of those became sales qualified leads? And, and then what was the the um the outcome because as you can see in this little graphic here engage acquire retain i rarely see an organization of all sizes including my own that marketing sales and customer experience or customer care cx there are many names for it i rarely see that there's a unicorn that does all three right and if you're an entrepreneur or business owner you're probably not doing all three, but if you have different people, there's usually some friction between each point. So are they talking to each other and are they going in the same direction? Super important to align your goals. So for me and my sales team, we use this little, I'm sure many of you have heard the acronym BANT, right? B-A-N-T, budget, authority, need, and timing. It's all about that. So when you're looking at the sales side of your lead gen campaigns, for me, I care a lot about sales with my clients, uh, not just the marketing and lead gen we do, because the bottom line is they're not going to continue to invest in lead generation campaigns if they can't see the attribution. Okay, you generated X number of leads and it produced X number of sales. So can't have a marketing conversation if you're not talking about sales, really can't. And yes, Back to the point about the salespeople having the honeymoon. Salespeople are always going to have different, um, you know, needs and challenges, but um, you have to put a lot of work into salespeople because they're always going to give you different uh, problems, right? The leads are not good. The leads are, are, you know, too old or they're not interested. I can't get the decision maker, you know? So it's, you, you got to be there with them. So let's, let's go through the key takeaways. Key takeaway, takeaways are, what, your, what strategy are you going to use? What's your offer? Who's your team? When are you going to launch one of these tactics? How, will you, how much money are you going to invest in it? Where are you going to promote it? And will your sales team deliver the best customer experience? And then here's the little list that I know uh, Dan, Lilia, and the team at BizHack here is going to share with you guys. I put a lot of thought into coming up with the resources because that can send you in a million different places. But these tools for you are very important in your lead gen 
there's lots of resources like specifically lead gen tool guide. This one that you see here, I posted on our website. I listed more than 75 tools. Many of them are free. Try it out. They're not one size fits all. You may like some, you may not like others. The marketing evaluation. I want to add value. That's what I want to do here for you guys. And then my last little, this one is not a meme. It's a Giphy because it's his birthday today. Christopher Walken turned 78. And what I want you guys to do leaving here today is do a little dance as you go up in the escalator to generating more leads for your business. So that being said, let's fly off. Thank you so much. And I will open it up to questions, Dan. You, you know, you're the only BizHack Live presenter in history who, despite my interruptions, still finished on time. Congratulations. <laughs> this, this really bodes well for the course we're going to teach together starting on Monday. Um, all right, let's open it up to questions. Um, we'll take the questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, Ian Taput uh, asked about whether this book strategy works for uh, corporate buyers. We answered that. Um, Ale Amy Williams, who's in the class, asked, what's our first step to prepare for next week? Um, I'll answer that one. We're going to be sending all of you guys an email with uh, onboarding information. For those of you like Amy who are retaking the program, we'd still like for you to retake those initial surveys because we do want to create a personalized learning journey report for you. We definitely want you to get into the learning management system. Um, so keep an eye out. Those emails will start uh, today. Um, the, the center of everything is the learning management system uh, or LMS called Learn Worlds. And all of the key material is going to be there. For those of you who took the course in the past, it wasn't quite as central to your experience as it will be moving forward. Uh, Ross Can is asking a great question. Ross has um, just confirmed with me that he's going to be joining our course. He's an architect, professional service provider. And Ross was asking, how do you determine where your ideal buyers are hiding? And um, I will preface this by saying that the very first two classes of the course dig deep into this key foundational question. But I'd love, Alex, for you to, if one of your clients asked you that, how would you answer that? Where do you find your ideal buyer? Yep, super simple for me. I'm going to go where my competitors are. That's it. There's a million tools online that I can do competitive research. But first and foremost, if in his case, you're an architect, presumably you know who your competitors are. Go look at what they're doing. Where are they advertising? Where are they posting content, engaging? Go to their YouTube. Do they have one video or a hundred? That might also present an opportunity. If you, if you find that your top five competitors are barely on YouTube, and you find out that there's people looking for your product or service on YouTube, guess what? That's a great place to be. But sure, I mean, look, you got to start with the top platforms. Google, go look at Google search. Are they looking for your products? How are they asking the questions? And if you see ads, then you can be sure that that's a place where cons your customers are. And then beyond that, once you decide which platforms you're going to go based on your competitive research, then you're going to say, okay, now I'm going to use the tools. Just like uh, Facebook audience, the audience tool can give you a wealth of information, right, Dan? Absolutely. You know, the, uh, I really like your answer, which is look at what your competitors are doing and copy them. You know, there's no greater flattery than copying. And I will say that a lot of digital marketing includes essentially letting your competitors pioneer and then you just copy now, that said, um, and then if you leverage your business story, your story of me, that immediately differentiates you from them. And frankly, if you use smart marketing, you'll be better at marketing at them once you've identified them. Um, I believe that in addition to that, looking at what your competitors do, leveraging the Facebook Audience Insights tool, which is a free tool, and some other free audience discovery tools that Google and Facebook and others have created, like Answer the Public is another great one, looking at search behavior. And then the third one is talking to your ideal customer. So think to yourself, who is the customer I love, who loves me and I want more of? And it's funny, because like when I look at my, um, the group of people here right now, I see Sylvia Bruger. 
Sylvia, uh, former head of sales for Univision Latin America. Now she's helping uh, work in her family business. She is by personality and by profession, one of the ideal customers. So I sit down with Sylvia, buy her a cup of coffee, and I ask her, what do you watch for t on TV? What do you care about? I know you have a daughter. Tell me about what, what, where you hang out on the web. Uh, another great example is Allison McLaney. Allison is um, uh, a startup founder. She's taking a family-run business, and she's now starting a new uh, uh, program. She went through the Win, uh, a, a new offering. She went through the Win Lab, which is uh, Babson University Women uh, Innovation Lab. Um, and so I know that anybody who goes through Win Lab is my ideal customer because. They vetted the heck out of her before they let her in. She's trained up and they didn't give her too much on digital marketing. Another great example of that is anybody in this group, like Armando and I in Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business, Goldman Sachs vets the heck out of you. You have to have more than 150K in revenue. And frankly, they don't do a great job teaching digital marketing. So the reason why you and Amy Williams and others are great for me is because in order for you to execute your Goldman Sachs growth plan, you need my help or someone like me. So what you do is you really learn about what are qualifying activities that your ideal customer would engage in. And that's where the ebook comes in to kind of go full circle. If you have an ebook and it's like, the top seven things you need to do as a Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business graduate in order to execute your growth plan. I could create that ebook in a couple of hours. And if you download that ebook, there's a really good chance that you're a Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business owner who doesn't know how to execute his or her growth strategy and needs help. I mean, otherwise, why in the world would you download that ebook? You see my point? And I think when we think of an ebook, I think of the 500 page manuscript that I spent five years writing as part of my FA, MFA program that's sitting on a shelf and not you know, a 30 page PDF that I could write in a few hours with a little bit of help, but they're both ebooks. Anyway, I see Alex kind of like laughing. Um, do a lot of business owners like me get in our own way? I know Michelle Rupp asked, should I write my own ebook? Hell yes. But just, <laughs> but just, but just maybe, maybe think of it more as like your e-booklet. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, even if you know you're going to need help with the editing, um, the ideation should come from you and your team. Maybe involve some clients. think your idea is great, Dan. Talking to clients. I posted in the um, comments here, Google surveys. If you're trying to find out where your customers are, you can actually activate a Google survey at the cost of one penny per survey. So create a $50 budget and create that survey asking the questions of like, where do people buy X, Y, Z? Or how do, how, how do people find an architect? I don't know, maybe it's Google search, maybe it's uh, Angie's list, maybe it's Facebook, I don't know, right? Might be, might be, it's very visual. So maybe it's Instagram or Pinterest. But if you do that survey, you launch it on um, Google surveys. I mean, listen, for 50 to $100, you'll have a ton of responses. Um, so that's another way to get your, uh, figure out your audience and where they are. Looking at the list of folks, I see that Natalie DuPont, one of our um, marketing coaches is on. So Natalie, if you're in a position and want to, we'd welcome you to comment on what you've been hearing today. Um, any other questions, guys? Uh, I see Sylvia has asked, if you're a content creator, you can see the most engaging themes to get inspirations for your ebook. Yeah. Ebooks are definitely an SEO strategy. And SEO, search engine optimization, is a fancy way of saying what people are searching for on Google. And there are lots of free tools that Google has. There's also tools like SEO Moz and others, third parties, where you can see like what people are searching for. And so if you wanna use an ebook as an SEO strategy, a Google search strategy, it could work really well. But if I, and I probably should write that ebook for Goldman Sachs alumni because it's become my most important marketing channel. 
but I don't need to like use SEO for that. I'm part of a app that a lot of you guys have found out about me through where I can just post something and for free, everybody sees it who is engaged in the app. And if I wrote that ebook, you know, seven steps to implementing using digital marketing to implement your growth strategy, I'll get a lot of downloads and a handful of those would sell. It would probably be the single most profitable form of marketing I could do. Anyway, I'm brainstorming out loud right now and I better go do this because I'm talking about it publicly. But, <laughs> but, you know, think about like who your ideal customer is. A lot of times look back at who is enrolling in your course, who you like to deal with. And I always add this like like to deal with or who you enjoy working with because there's nothing more liberating, Alex, than firing a client. And what that means is sometimes you realize as you grow your business and you stop being totally desperate for revenue, when you realize that there are actually some clients who cost you money. Anyway, um, we're wrapping up here. Alex, anything you wanted to say about firing a client and identifying your ideal customer? I really do feel like the two foundations of all business, small business marketing are, I mean, not the foundations, but the two key pillars. Once you've set your business story is identifying your ideal customer and then giving them an irresistible offer. If you can get that right, then everything else about marketing is just sort of execution tactics, which channel, exactly how to phrase it, what's the best irresistible offer. But if you can provide value for free in exchange for their contact info and you give it to the type of person who you love working with, all of marketing really boils down to that. Yeah, yeah, and and I think, you know, just know that it takes time, right? So I just recently launched a, uh, relaunched a podcast that I had in 2015, except it was called Entrepreneur Ninja. And I'm like, oh, let me rename it to Dadpreneur. I worked on it all of last year alongside parallel to the uh, ebook and the other stuff that we were doing, right? Because I said, I want people to see Predict and me as like the expert in lead generation, online lead generation. And um, it took time because I'm like most entrepreneurs. I see shiny stuff and I'm like, oh, hey, you know, and then my team and my wife, everybody has to be like, uh, no, this is what's working. This is how like the clients need you. So you can't go like, just go play and, you know, have your pet projects uh, on, with cryptocurrency or whatever is going on. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to put my head into lead generation. I'm going to just, you know, talk about those 22 million leads, the systems that we've built. And so I've been creating this uh, podcast. I might think up, up, up to episode 30. There's 20 of them out there. Um, but I think you have to get out of your way, right, Dan? You said about perfection. I so agree with you. I made a big boo-boo yesterday that I was beating myself up because I said, you know what? With the podcast, it's a passion project. I can't allow my team who we have paying clients to work on my pet project, my, my podcast. The podcast is to educate people and to be an expert. So I'm going to do it alone. I'm going to use my virtual assistant to help me a little bit. But beyond that, I want it to be like the basic cost, which by the way, you guys will have a link on it. I actually laid out a four-part uh, uh, guide on what I did to launch this podcast over the last six months. And anyways, I finally arrived at send my email blast yesterday, right? I've, I've done all this stuff over the last six months. And yesterday I said, okay, I'm going to send my email blast, but I'm not even going to use our own CRM. Again, trying to keep it outside of Predict. This is my, you know, passion project. So I use um, uh, Twitter's uh, Review. It's a, it's a company that Twitter bought. It's a newsletter service called Review, uh, R-E-V-E, you, something like that. Anyways, I'm like, okay, it's free. It's good. Let me just use that. So I upload out of a list of about 5,000 people. I narrow it down, segment it just to the people that I know want to hear this podcast. I narrow it down to about 800 and something people. I'm like, all right, let's go. So I test it. It's good. Just like what we all do with email. But again, it bit me because I should have let my professional team work with me on it. So I go and I click to send it at 6.30 a.m. yesterday. And at around 7 a.m., my wife emails me and says, oh, Everything looks great. The embed, the call, like everything, except for the placeholder for first name says, hi, first name. Are you kidding me? Like what a rookie mistake, man. I've sent freaking tens of millions of emails 
And the one that I send for the podcast is hi, first name, not, not hi, Dan. And of course, you know, I've got people busting my chops. Hey, Alex, what's going on? You forgot how to do email. I'm like, I, I swear I tested it. I did this. But anyways, the point is it, I beat myself up. Um, but if I'm going to get everything perfect, it's never going to get done, man. And yeah, you know, if there's a few trolls that are going to hold it against me, have a nice day. I don't care. Move on. I focus on the people who like my stuff. Right. So I love it. Well, Alex, you know, in a sense, we've run out of time, but really, in a sense, this is the beginning of a chapter, a, a beautiful relationship. Um, you know, this is the first time we've ever talked together, and it's just getting me excited, man. I'm Same so here. excited. I'm thrilled. To be teaching the BizHack Lead Building System with you as my co-pilot. Um, I want to wrap up by just saying a couple things. Number one, somebody asked... Okay, you create an ebook. How, what channels do you promote it on? And I'm gonna, this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. So I'm gonna get on my high horse for a second. I've come to believe after seven years of both trying to learn this stuff and teach it that the number one problem with the way digital marketing is, 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 is taught to people is that they talk about channels or platforms. It doesn't matter what channel you're on. It matters which audience you're serving. And then you just meet them whatever channels they might be on. So if someone says to me, I've written an ebook, should I promote it on LinkedIn? My response is it depends. It depends. Is your ideal customer active on LinkedIn? And if not, then no. Put it on Pinterest, right? You know, if they're, if they're there or TikTok or Clubhouse. A lot of you guys are like, should I be on Clubhouse? Amy Williams is super active on Clubhouse. Well, it depends. Is your ideal customer on Clubhouse? And if so, how do you best serve them there? So the, the reason why I hate talking about channels is because it takes what should be relatively simple and it makes it really complex. Digital marketing gets complicated for small businesses when you start going into channel execution strategy. Like Google ads alone could fill up a 10 week course. Facebook the same, I mean, we scratched the surface over the five weeks. Like if you then took all the channels you could or should be on, SEO, LinkedIn, website, I mean their entire companies, entire curricula, Amazon, for God's sake, it will overwhelm you. But if you say to yourself, what is my business story that differentiates me from my competitors? Who is my ideal audience? And what is an offer that'll get them off their duff and get them to give me their email and their phone number? And that's all you worry about? You'll be very successful. And oh, by the way, that might mean going to a chamber meeting or using the 10KSB alumni app. Like it doesn't have to be that hard. So that's what we do. We simplify it. We don't oversimplify it because it does get complicated when it comes into the nitty gritty, but we're going to make it as simple as possible and specific to folks with limited time, money, and budget, uh, time, budget, and, and, and resources. If y'all are interested, uh, the course starts on Monday. Go to our website and apply there. Alex and I are going to be the lead instructors. We have an amazing teaching team and an extraordinary class coming up. And without, um, I just want to say, Alex, thank you for taking the leap with me. And we'll see you all back here for BizHack Live next Wednesday. We're going to have a small business panel discussion with five small business support providers, tons of resources. It's going to be a dynamite session. So if we don't see you in class on Monday, we'll see you here at 1230 with BizHack Live. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you, everyone.